Well, good evening all. This is Marvin Four, ready for the presentation on uh, how to get your best result at the Marmot. My objective is to give you the keys to achieving your best performance on the day when we come to July the 3rd uh, in just a few weeks time now. So without more ado, let's get into it. Just a quick reminder first of the course itself. It remains the toughest of the French Grand Fondos uh, and it represents a major physical and mental challenge which should not be underestimated. In particular, the four climbs total over 65 kilometers of climbing. There are two essentials uh, to get right for a successful ride. And then there are plenty of other smaller things that we'll look at as well. But these are the two essentials that I'll spend most of the time on. First of all, pacing. So how to get the right pace on the climbs. And secondly, fueling, because if you don't fuel over, over such a long event, there's, there's no way you'll reach the, reach the end. So both of these are absolutely vital. Now, your pacing strategy depends on your objective. And these four different strategies or four different objectives, pardon, yeah, excuse me, that you can see there result in a different pacing strategy. So your first uh, objective might be if you're one of the five or ten best riders on the start line, then you might have the objective of, of winning. If you want to win, you have no choice in your pacing strategy. Your pace is imposed really by the others. Uh, you must ride with the lead group and bide your time to attack, um, most notably on the final climb. I'm not going to talk any more about that because I doubt that anyone who's going to win is, is listening to this presentation. So let's move on to the, the personal best. If your goal is a personal best, you must ride as close as possible to your limits, but without ever going over them. If you try to gain, if you try to ride hard on the Glandon, for example, and gain two or three minutes on that particular climb, that can easily cost you 10 minutes or more on the later climbs. So you have to climb at the highest pace that you can sustain for the full 65 kilometers of climbing. Now, for most people, it's actually going to be between 70 and 75% of your FTP or, or, your, or your maximum heart rate, which corresponds to upper zone two for most people, which is your endurance zone. So it's very much an endurance ride, unlike much shorter sporties, which you can ride at tempo or even, uh, uh, or even near threshold for much of the time. Now, if you're particularly well-trained and a strong rider, you should be able to push it up to 80% which is in the tempo uh, zone. But we'll look at how to determine the right uh, level for you in a, in a few minutes. Just be aware of one thing. Um, deciding pace at the outset is inher inherently limiting. It will result in, a, in better results on average, but it won't produce the outliers. So it won't be uh, either much better or worse uh, than, uh, th th than it could be. But this is, this is the way to have a... Uh, let's say somewhere between a conservative and a strong ride is to determine your pace at the outset and really stick to it. Now, just to, to complete things, let's look at the other two objectives. You might have an objective just to finish. And if that's, if that's your goal, then you need to work backwards from the cutoff time at Bourgdoison and just make sure you get there before the cutoff. Uh, that, the cutoff is at, at, a, is at six o'clock. Bourgdoison, of course, is the town at the foot of the Alpe d'Huez, so it's at the start of the final climb. If you get through there before six o'clock, then you can take as long as you want to finish and you're still a finisher. Uh, but if you, if you reach there later than six o'clock, it doesn't matter. Even if you could go up there in an hour, you will not be a finisher. So the key here is to give yourself an objective uh, earlier on, and you really need to be on the Galibier by uh, at the, top, uh, the summit of the Galibier, uh, by four o'clock to be sure of being in Bourgoison by, by, by six o'clock. Okay, the final objective that you is perfectly acceptable, of course, is to is simply to enjoy it. Uh, you know, the whole purpose of doing these events for most people is to enjoy it anyway. Uh, they might also want a personal best, but many people are there just to enjoy the ride, which is absolutely fine. Uh, it's a rather different objective to the others because it means different things to different people, of course. Uh, if it is important to finish, while enjoying it, then you need to follow the advice I just gave. But if you don't care whether you finish or not, you just want to be out in the mountains in a, in a, in, in a supported and, uh, uh, and, and, and with a group and so on, then the pace you ride at is determined by your level of enjoyment and perhaps by the people you're riding with. So you, then you just ignore the other competitors, anyone who's riding hard, 
and just take advantage of the magnificent scenery and, in, and, and have a great ride. Okay, so what I'm going to come back to now is the uh, personal best, um, because I think the, probably the majority of people on this call are interested in getting a personal best. Here, the goal then is to ride as close as possible to your limits, but without ever going over them. So the question becomes, well, how do you know where these limits are? So that's what we're going to look at now. This is the first point. It's a really important principle. Your race pace is derived from evidence, not from hope. Miracles don't happen very often, and it's unlikely that you're going to be much stronger at the Marmot than you were in training or at other events you may have ridden already this year, or perhaps you're planning to ride in, uh, in June. So look for the evidence and analyze the evidence is the, is the message here. So I'm going to show you a personal example of that. But uh, first, be aware that the evidence, of course, is historical evidence, so it needs to be adjusted uh, on the day. And you can adjust that on the day, depending upon the recent training you've done, how successful that's been or how unsuccessful that's been, uh, the quality of the taper you were able to carry out the last 10 days or, or, or a week at any rate, the level of stress you've been under in the last uh, week or 10 days, uh, the quality of sleep you've been able to have, and then uh, you, when you actually get to the start line, how motivated do you feel on that particular day? Because motivation, the mental side is almost as important as the physical. And what's your general feel? So all of those factors uh, should make you adjust slightly up or slightly down the theoretical target that you, that you can work out by looking at previous events. So we're gonna take a personal example from my own uh, data. When I was preparing for the Marmot 2019, this is what my power duration chart looked like. And so the, my critical power at the time was about 275 watts, uh, which was more or less the same as my FTP. So my 60 minute FTP, in other words, the power I could hope to sustain for 60 minutes. There's obviously no way that I could have ridden all the climbs at 275 watts on the Marmot uh, because the majority of them are longer for, 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 for someone uh, for, for a critical power of 275 watts and uh, the sort, uh, and my weight, which is around 70, 71 kilos, uh, the climbs are obviously going to be longer than an hour. So the climbs are too long, and above all, the repetition over 65 kilometers would have been impossible. So the question is, well, how much to discount that 275 watts? How, how much to reduce it by? So the way to work that out is to look at uh, your historical data. So here's evidence from previous events that I, that I rode in that same year. And so I rode Liège, Bastion Liège, I rode the Trois Cols, I rode the Time Megève, and I rode the Grand Bourg, which were all, all four um, competitive events. The first two I rode competitively, and the second two I actually rode um, with clients. I was accompanying clients, coaching them, so I was, uh, they were sub-max efforts, so that provides a a floor as opposed to a max to what I could have done at that time. So when you, uh, I, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to go into great detail on this chart, but you can, you can the, the basic principle is you try and find efforts you've made that are comparable, and then you work out, well, given that, what should I be able to do on the Marmot? So if we look at the, the percentage of FTP, because that's more relevant to you than the actual the absolute wattage, watt, wattage numbers that I produced, yours might be higher or lower, um, but in percent of FTP, you can see there so on Liège, Bastion Liège, which was a long event, 77%, on the Twaco, 88%, so that's quite a big range. I decided to target on the Marmot um, 76%, which were, corresponded for me to 210 watts on the, all the climbs with the exception of the Galibier. Be aware that on the Galibier, you must set a lower target because, um, because of two reasons, really. The first is you're going to be tired by then because the Galibier comes immediately after the telegraph, which is typically an, hour, an hour's climb. You only have a very short descent to Valois and then you're straight onto the Galibier, so you have no time to recover. And secondly, of course, you're at altitude by now. You're, over, you're getting close to 2,000 meters, and by the time you reach the summit, you're way over 2,000 meters. Uh, so therefore you need to knock that back by 10% by or so 
and um, I think on the Galibier targeted 69% of my FTP, which is 10% off on, on looking at the absolute watts. Now be aware that the higher your watts per kilo, uh, for reference, mine were uh, 3.9 or thereabouts, the higher your target percent of FTP can be, simply because watts per kilo, of course, are what make you go up the climb faster. And so the faster you can finish the climb, the higher the intensity you can do it at. So this is the way to work out your target power. If you don't have power, you can, if you don't have a power meter, you can do similar calculations using your heart rate. And if you don't have heart rate either, well, you're, you, you've got to fall back on the good old um, feeling. How did I feel? And try and keep the same feeling. So let's look now at fueling, which is the other essential part of it, nutrition and hydration. Remember I said there are really two key aspects to this. There's pacing and there's fueling. So whether you get this right or wrong will have a massive impact on your performance. Be aware, first of all, that the, you can expect to burn something of the order of 5,000 calories on the marmot. It might be a little bit less if you're relatively light and you're female. It'll be more if you're male and heavy, uh, but it's a good sort of reference number, 5,000 calories. It's, it's roughly what I would expect to, to burn. Uh, and I would think anyone, uh, it, it, any, anyone in the, in, the, in the sort of the average will, will certainly be at that sort of level. Now, the problem is there's no way to consume this much during the event. A simple calculation is enough to prove that to you. Um, a bar, a typical energy bar is, um, is anywhere between 100 and 200 calories. So that would be at least 25 bars. Um, so there's, uh, there's no way you can eat 25 bars uh, while you're riding the marmot. So what can you do? Well, you need to start with a full tank, obviously. Um, so eat plenty of carbs in the week beforehand, particularly the two or three days before, um, without going overboard the night before. So the Saturday night is the marmots on Sunday. Uh, you want to eat normally the Saturday night and limit the amount of fiber you eat. You don't want too much fiber in your stomach for obvious reasons on, on Sunday morning. Uh, it's rec I recommend taking breakfast three hours before so that you can digest it properly. Uh, that obviously means getting up very early. Uh, what a lot of people would do um, uh, is to get up three or even three and a half hours before, have breakfast, and then go back to bed and go back to sleep for an hour, hour, hour and a half or so before, before getting up to get ready for the start. So that means your tank is full and ready to go. Now, once you actually start, um, the amount you need depends on the relative percentage of carbohydrate to fat your body uses while you're climbing at the pace you choose. Um, and the more your body burns fat, the less carbs you need. Um, but uh, it's too late to do anything about that now. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, it can, of course, be trained, but it takes months to do so. Um, so the, the actual amount you can consume in terms of carbs is going to depend on the amount you're used to consuming in training. And I don't suggest you attempt to increase that uh, dramatically um, at the marmot um, because it just won't work. You, your, your gut won't be able to handle it. So from the start, so, con, so from, you need to consume basically a minimum of 250 calories an hour. That's roughly 60 grams of, of, um, of, of carbs, of, of glucides, um, of sugars. Um, and how do you know? How, so it's so a minimum of 250, maximum of 500. The pros can consume 500, but then they've trained, they're training for that all the time. Uh, not many amateurs can get to that level, but you should be able to get to somewhere between 250 and let's say 350, 400, particularly if you've trained for it. Uh, how to know how much you're consuming? Well, these are, um, a rough rule of thumb is that pretty much everything contains about 100 calories. Uh, a bottle of energy mix has about 120, a gel has between 80 and 120, uh, an energy bar, as I said earlier, has between 100 and 200, so you need to read the bar. Uh, the, big, the, big, um, the big ones have more, obviously, than the smaller ones. Um, a medium-sized banana has uh, between 100 and 150, depending on how ripe it is. So, so with that, you, you can calculate, well, I need somewhere between two and four items per hour. 
and that's what I need to consume throughout the whole event. So let's look now at the course in detail and break it down into sections. For, for me, there are seven sections on the Marmot that are really quite distinct and, and deserve to be looked at um, di uh, differently. So we'll take them one by one. But before we take them, let's uh, first look at the start and what needs to be done before the start. Um, the first thing to do, the first thing to realize if you've not done the Marmot before is that it's nearly all, even if the day is going to be hot, it's nearly always pretty cold at the start um, because the, the sun doesn't get onto Bourgoisin until quite a bit later in the, in, in the morning. And if you're staying in Alpa Juez, which many people do, you, uh, unless you've got the luxury of a transport to get you down to the bottom, you're going to have to ride down. And the temperature can easily be um, no, barely above zero, um, certainly no more than five or six degrees in Alpa Juez, and it won't be more than 10, 10 at the most down at the bottom. So you're going to get very cold going down. Um, if you if you try to go down in in in, in summer in summer summer kit, I mean, it basically would be it would be very foolish to do that. So two solutions: either, either you go down wearing um, you know a full full proper jacket, knee warmers, and the rest of it, which means you've got to find you either got to find a way to dump that um, somewhere safe to, so you can pick it up later, um, or give it to someone, or else you're going to have to carry it through the through the whole event. Now that might be necessary if the weather's bad. So everything depends on the weather on the day. An alternative is to, and we, I've seen a lot of people do this, is to um, put a, is, is, is to use a, a bin liner and rubber gloves and um, you know, basically cover yourself in plastic bin liners, which, uh, which is good enough to stay reasonably warm on the descent. And you can obviously then take that off and just toss it in a bin when you get to the bottom. So that, that, that can work. I recommend you warm up thoroughly before you get into the pen, um, but try to get in the pen at least 30 minutes, maybe even 40 minutes before the start, uh, because otherwise you're gonna find yourself at the back of hundreds, if not thousands of people. Uh, and that's clearly a, a handicap at the start. You, you, you're gonna be starting behind a lot of people you could otherwise ride with. Stay warm when you're waiting. Um, you know, any, anything you can do to stay warm is, uh, is, is good and, and, and think positive for the rest of the day. So that's before the start. Now, we're off. The first part is always a drag race. It always starts very, very fast. You've got 15 kilometers of, of basic, basically flat, well, it's 10 flat, and then you go up the dam, up the dam then it's flat again. Uh, it's a wide road, it's very fast, it's close to traffic. Um, so everybody's um, hammering it as hard as they can. What's really important for you to do is to pick the right wheel to follow and, uh, and, and at, the pace that, at a pace that's sustainable for you behind that wheel. Um, don't go in the, you know, spin your legs and don't go in the red. If you're pulling, if, if you're way above threshold um, for most of those 15 kilometers, then you'll, you'll, you'll have burned a ton of matches and you will seriously regret it later. Uh, so you want to be in the wheels at your target pace. Now, you'll have to make a few efforts probably to get there. It's okay to burn a couple of matches, but you don't want to be burning match after match after match. Be careful when you get to the climb to the dam. It's relatively short, so it's tempting to power up there, uh, but much better to switch into the small ring and uh, spin up uh, to keep uh, preserve your, your, your legs. It gets flat again once you're on top of the dam, and then obviously you speed up and get back into, uh, into the wheels. So that takes us to the foot of the glandon. Now, once we're on the glandon, um, here you've got to, uh, uh, here you really have to be careful. The same thing happens every year. Each group attacks the initial slopes of the glandon at a pace that's far too high for them to sustain to the summit, uh, let alone, of course, all the way to the finish. So the single most important piece of advice for riding the Marmot is that from the start of the Glandon onwards, set your own pace at your own rhythm uh, and ignore anyone that overtakes you. Either you'll catch them later or they're stronger with, than you anyway, so there's no point in trying to stay with them. Okay, you're going to achieve your best time by keeping a constant level of intensity on all the climbs, which, uh, I, 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 need I remind you, add up to 65 kilometers. 
the gland on itself is is probably is is definitely the most irregular of the climbs. There's actually a descent in the or two descents in the middle of it. The first one's quite a surprising descent, quite steep and twisty, um, and the slope varies quite a bit. Uh, you're even without taking into account those descents. Uh, it's a total of 23 kilometers. You're climbing over a thousand meters, so it's a significant climb. So again, if you have your power meter, stick to your target output and don't be tempted to push too hard. If not, watch your heart rate. Um, and if you don't have that either, then rely on your sensations and uh, make sure you can talk easily, at least in short sentences. If you can't speak comfortably, you're going too hard. Now, a reminder on fueling on the glandon, uh, you need to get in the good, into good habits straight away. So you should be eating anywhere, but depending on how much time you're gonna take on the glandon, it's at least four, it might be eight items of, of food or, 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 and of course drink, you need to drink at least a bottle, possibly, quite possibly two bottles during the time it'll take you to get up there. Um, so, uh, so make sure you do that. It's easy to forget once, once the race has started. Uh, it's very, very important. A lot of people will put a sticker on their um, on their handlebars to remind them or on their stem to remind them to to eat and drink. So uh, that's that, that can be a very good idea. Now you reach the top of the Glandon. There's a there's a feed station up there. Um, so you probably probably need to stop there. Um, Depending upon how many people are there, uh, it's now you go over a timing mat, so uh, because the descent is untimed, so you're off time. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you spend an extra five minutes up there too much, at least from the timing perspective. Um, I don't recommend spending much time up there, however, for two reasons. The first is it's going to be it's almost certainly still cold because uh, it'll be nine o'clock, nine thirty in the morning. Uh, sun will be up, but it'll still be cold. And the other thing is you'll be, your legs will stiffen up. Uh, so you want to spend, you actually want to spend the least time possible up there. Um, grab, grab whatever you need. Um, if there's a huge queue, it might make sense to go over, uh, start the descent and get some water somewhere on the descent. There are a couple of water fountains on the way down in the villages uh, that you can uh, find on, uh, on Google or, or, or Google Maps or whatever. And, um, and, and stop there, that, that can save an awful lot of time if there's a huge queue for water on top. Uh, make sure you get, so as soon as you get there, make sure you put on a, a jacket, um, even if it's not too cold, you'll definitely need the jacket in the descent. Um, and um, so, so, so then over you go. Now be aware, it's untimed for a reason. It's untimed because it's a dangerous ascent, particularly the first part. It's steep, it's difficult, it's, it's technical. Uh, very tight um, so stay concentrated and there's absolutely no point in taking it fast because again it's untimed uh, it would be daft to to have a have, have an accident there and of course it does happen uh, make sure you eat and drink on the second part which is a bit easier um, when it's safe to do so keep eating keep drinking when you get down to the bottom um, the goal uh, for this next part, which is up the valley of the Morien, and it's a, it's a false flat climb. The goal there is to reach the telegraph, the foot of the next climb, um, having used the least energy possible uh, for the speed you're going at, which means, of course, getting in a group and riding, uh, riding in the group and, and just spinning your legs as, as much as you can. You're still, you still need to recover from the effort you made on the glandon. Um, so, uh, so, so you want to spin as much as you can and try and avoid those burning those matches and making hard efforts to, uh, uh, to stay with the group. Our timing restarts at the bottom in saint Etienne de Queen before uh, you start up the valley. Um, immediately after the right turn at the bottom of the descent, you'll see the timing mat there. I uh, strongly recommend you don't cross the timing mat on your own, because of course, if you cross on your own, you're not in a group, so you're not gonna benefit from riding with, with other people. Uh, so if you do happen to be on your own when you reach the timing mat, just, just hang around uh, a few meters back from it until, a few, until a, a few other riders arrive to form a group, and then off you go with them. If you do find yourself alone on that uh, section, there's a rather nasty little climb, in fact, there are several nasty little clouds you can see there's a first bump just under the 22 on my slide there uh, that often makes groups uh, break up if you if you feel that it would 
costs too much energy to stay with the group going up that doesn't matter just drop off because the next group will be no more than 30 seconds or a maximum of a minute behind so you're going to you're going to lose very little um, and then you can integrate another group so i, I don't recommend uh, you know, killing yourself to stay with a group it, it, it makes no sense you've still got the telegraph the galibier and uh, and El Pajuez to climb afterwards so you reach the the end of the valley you turn turn right and start up the telegraph um I, I consider these two together because the, the the short descent to valois in the middle it takes literally five minutes um so it's really a 35 kilometer climb uh, with a short descent in the middle you're climbing almost 2,000 meters of vertical uh it's massive the telegraph itself is the easier part, not only because it's lower down, but it's also a wider road. It's relatively shady. Uh, it's a steady gradient. Uh, the Galibia is a much, um, it's more irregular. It's much steeper in places. Um, and, uh, and what makes it particularly hard, of course, is the altitude. Uh, as you get closer and closer to the top, the oxygen obviously gets so rare. Uh, the air gets a bit rarefied and you simply cannot produce the same amount of power that you would still be able to if you were at much lower altitude. That's why I mentioned earlier that the power, my target power on the telegraph was 210 watts, on the Galibier it was 190 watts. Uh, and that's a reasonable amount to drop. You drop basically by about 10% because of that altitude. Okay, don't make the mistake of trying to push at the same power on both. You'll just, uh, you'll, you'll be going too hard. Uh, when you get to the top of the Galibier, there's another feed station up there. Um, you def you will almost certainly need to, in fact, you're bound, to, you must stop there uh, to completely fill your bottles and to make sure you've got something to eat. Because the crucial thing you need to do during the long ride, the 45 kilometer descent down to Bourgdoison, is you must refuel uh, dr uh, both with food and water. Um, so hydrate well so that you're able to manage the final climb. Uh, it's one of the worst mistakes you can make on the marmot is to uh, is not to refuel well enough um, during that long, long descent. The first eight kilometers of the descent are very steep and fast. Um, the um, the road is fairly narrow. It's quite some of the turns are quite technical, so it's potentially dangerous. You need to be a bit careful on the first uh, those first eight kilometers until you reach the Col du Lotare, where you hit the main road. And from then on, um, the road is normally closed. I, expect, I would expect it to be closed as usual. Uh, so you can use the whole road and uh, it's, it's wide, it's a main road. It's really, uh, it's, really, it's really good for riding fast in a group, um, but it's not good for riding fast alone because it's, it's not very steep. It's, typ it's typically a falls flat around three, 4% for a good, most of it. And there's very often a headwind. So it's, it's really important to get in a group again, don't make huge efforts on your own. If you find yourself on your own, just keep looking over your shoulder and as soon as another, as a group comes up, jump on the back. Uh, ideally, you want to ride in the group the whole way uh, to Bourg uh, and the foot of the final climb. Uh, be aware of several dark tunnels. If you've never ridden this road before, they might surprise you. Uh, one of them is quite narrow and uh, not well lit. Uh, they're also at the end, there are a couple of unexpected climbs uh, which are quite nasty and can cause cramps if you take them too hard. Uh, so don't hesitate to, to, to drop out of the big ring back into the small ring and to spin up rather than trying to power up them. Uh, I would even suggest letting the group go. If the group, if the group is powering up them, you might be better off just letting the group go, especially if you're starting to feel twinges of cramp. So there's one last challenge to come, which is um, last but by no means least. Uh, when you reach the bottom of Alpages, you'll have ridden uh, more than 100, 160 kilometers and done three huge climbs. Uh, so here you go, here you are, you've got the final effort of the day. There's a feed station there, and uh, it's almost certainly, you certainly should have drunk and eaten everything you have with you so that you need to pick up more uh, for the final climb. For most people, it's going to take between one and two hours, that final climb um and uh, it's um you, what you need to tell yourself well is this is not much after all those hard months of intense training i've put myself through uh, it's just another one maximum two hours to go uh let's do it but be 
prudent. Be very, very careful uh, with the speed at which you tackle the, uh, um, the start of this final climb. This was, uh, uh, I, I, I said I was going to tell you what happened on my, uh, on my, in 2019, um, when I did the, when I was trying to, to sustain those, those levels of um, pace that I mentioned earlier, uh, everything went extremely well. Uh, until I started up the final climb, and then I made the, the 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 foolish error of starting too hard up the first uh, up the foot of Alpajuez. The problem with the foot of Alpajuez is it's particularly steep. You've got these steep ramps in the straight line, and then it flattens off in the bend. So the average gradient doesn't look too horrible, but the fact is that 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 um, the the bends are completely flat and they're quite large. Uh, so that significantly reduces the average. So the, the, the straights are actually at 11, 12, even 13 percent my moment. And if you try and go up there anywhere near threshold, you're going to, you're just going to burn all your matches and, you, and you're going to you, 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 you're going to kill yourself you know, between inverted commas, kill yourself. That's exactly what happened to me. And I had to I had to stop and I wound up losing probably 15 or 20 minutes on that climb compared to what I should have been able to do. So. Prudence, prudence, prudence. When you reach the foot of Alpajuez, slow right down just for the first three kilometers. Take them really easy. Try and spin. It's actually hard to spin because it's so steep, but use your lowest gear and, 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 and just take it easy. Once you get through the village of Lagarde, it eases off and becomes more regular and more reasonable. So at that point, you can start to progressively put a bit more power down if you can, of course. Um, and the energy you saved earlier in the day at the cost of a few seconds on the Glandon and a few seconds at the, uh, at the beginning of the climb of Alpajuez will, will now start to pay back in minutes. And if you've managed your effort right, uh, you'll be able to slowly increase your pace and you'll find yourself overtaking dozens of other riders in those last few kilometers. Uh, and I, last in 2019, I sadly had the opposite experience. I was overtaken by dozens of people as I was struggling up and feeling absolutely exhausted so big mistake so there we are if you reach the top uh, if you do that if you do it right you'll reach the top feeling strong and you'll be able to uh, even uh, do a, a put in a little sprint to get to the finish line now so reaching reaching the end of the presentation let me give you uh, uh, five mistakes to avoid and then just five uh, go faster tips uh, quickly so the five mistakes to avoid it's really a reminder now we've covered, uh, I think, most of them. Um, so the first mistake is going too fast at the start uh, and on the Glandon, of course, and too fast on uh, at the start of up Alpa Duez, as we've just as I've just talked about. Second mistake is burning too many matches, trying to stay with groups on the uh, on, on in the two valleys. Third mistake is forgetting to eat and drink enough at the vital moments. This is really, really important. If you do that, if you, do, if you don't fuel adequately, you won't have enough energy to get up Alpa Juez at anywhere near the pace that you could have done. Fourth um, mistake is taking silly risks when descending, even, uh, you know, even when the timing is on, so descending to Valois, descending uh, uh, the, the, off, off the Galibier. Um, it, it, it makes no sense to try and gain a few seconds and, and wind up having an accident. So please don't do that. Uh, and finally, the fifth mistake that a lot of people make, and I haven't talked about this yet, is to do with clothing. Um, if you have inadequate clothing, you're, you're not going to do as well as you should. Uh, that can be inadequate, can either be too, too much too, and you're too hot, uh, or it can be obviously the opposite and you're, you're way too cold. Uh, the weather, it's really important to look at the weather, not just in Alpa Juez or in Bourgoison, but right round. Uh, look at what's going to happen on the Galibier, look at what the expected temperature is, uh, look at whether there's any risk of precipitation, if it might rain. In the worst case, we've sometimes seen sleet on the Galibier. Um, and if, you, if you're trying to, dis to go over there and descend when it's sleeting and therefore the temperature is around zero degrees, at the sort of speed you'll be descending at, you're feeling it feels like minus five or minus 10. If you don't have long fingered gloves, uh, you're in serious trouble because you can't break. You, you have no feeling in your fingers and you won't be able to break at the corners. Uh, so, so that leads a lot of people to abandon and abandoning on top of the Galibier when it's that cold is not funny. So make sure you've got the right clothing. My recommendations are for thin layers, easily adaptable. Uh, so things like arm warmers, 
long fingered gloves if there's a risk of needing them. You definitely need a rain jacket if there's any risk of rain. You might need a cap or a bonnet of some sort. You might need a neck warmer, perhaps leg warmers. Um, it, again, it depends on the weather. Um, so the que question becomes, well, how, how on earth can I carry all of that? Uh, plus the food and plus the drink. Uh, so the solution to that, there are, there are two options. Either, um, I know some people don't like uh, big saddle bags or, or, or frame bags. So either you swallow your pride and you put one on. Um, or there's an old timers trick, which is simply to wear two jerseys uh, and uh, the inside. And, and when you've got two jerseys on, obviously, you've got um, six pockets instead of three. Uh, so if it's going to be very hot, you don't want two jerseys for obvious reasons. But if it is a cold day, it, it's not necessarily a big deal to wear two jerseys. And, and then you've got the six pockets instead of just three. So those are the five main mistakes to avoid. Uh, now, five go faster tips. First one is, uh, is, is uh, it would be too stupid to have a, have a mechanical or to have a brake rubbing or to have a badly oiled chain or something. So make sure your bike is checked and in tip top condition before you start, first one. Second one, um, remember to climb efficiently and economically. What do I mean by that? Well, keep your upper body still and relaxed when you're climbing seated. All your energy needs to be focused into your legs. Your upper body should be stable, should be relaxed. Your shoulders should be, shouldn't be any stress or tension in your arms and your shoulders, except perhaps on the steeper sections where you need, may need to pull a bit. But most of the time you should be completely relaxed. No movement in the upper body. Uh, you're not gripping the bars hard. You're just driving from the hips from a stable core. So that's something you should obviously be working on in training. Hopefully you all are. Uh, but you need to remember that uh, when you get tired, because the more tired you get, the more you're going to start uh, moving your upper body around. As the French say, pedaling with your ears, you know, sh uh, your head's bobbing about, and that's just a waste of energy. So, so think of that when you're climbing. Another tip uh, to climb efficiently is when it gets steep, push down harder on your heels, so you drop your heels. Um, that makes for a more efficient pedal stroke when it's steep. Finally, when, uh, when climbing, stand up regularly uh, on the pedals and drop your cadence when you stand up. So either you take advantage of a, of a steeper section to stand up and keep the same um, gears, or as you change gear two or even three gears to drop your cadence right down. If you stand up and, and uh, at the same cadence as you use when you're seated, you're just gonna spike your heart rate and it's not gonna feel like a rest at all. It's actually gonna feel worse. So the point of standing is to get a rest, it's to stretch a bit, it's to use your muscles differently so that you can then sit down again and carry on. Uh, when I say regularly, I mean 20% uh, of the time. Uh, third, minimize your stops. Uh, it's obvious that uh, you know, the event is timed, so the less time you spend stopped, the, the quicker you're gonna finish. Uh, what are the stops? Well, it's, for, it's at feed stations and it's to take clothes on and off, it's, to, it, it's for a comfort stop or whatever it may be. Uh, just be, you know, just think strategically about it. Prepare yourself to make the stops as, as rapid and as efficient as possible, so you're not wasting time unnecessarily. Uh, you have to stop, of course, but uh, keep them as short as you possibly can. Fourth, um, this may seem strange to have to say this, but I see every year I see a lot of people just coasting downhill. Uh, there are two very good reasons to pedal downhill. The first is it's uh, you get extra speed for very little extra effort. I'm not suggesting you put a huge amount of power on the pedals, but even, even 100 watts is going to increase your speed typically by two, three, or, or four or five kilometers per hour. Um, so I'm referring here not to the steep descents, but to the more um, the easier descents when the, 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 uh, the gradient might be 5% um, or less. Um, and the other important reason for pedaling downhill is it helps you, it helps your blood keep flowing in your legs and flushing the toxins out and recovering uh, because uh, no matter which descent you're on, you've got another climb before the finish because as you know, you finish on, on Alpha Duet. So it's really important to pedal downhill. I can't emphasize that enough. Don't put too much pressure on the pedals. You, you know, you're not trying to, uh, you're not sprinting downhill, but you, you, you're basically uh, turning your legs to gain a little bit of extra speed and to spin out the, the toxins. Uh, fifth point is to use your head. Uh, I can't go into great details on uh, here in the time we got available on mental strategies, um, but this is about you know when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Uh, there will be tough moments. Most people go through highs and lows on the marmot. Uh, in my experience, it's usually on, this, on the 
the last third or so of the Galibia that I personally go through a low. Um, so when you when you get to a low, the first thing to tell yourself is things will get better. You know, I will get over the, the coal. I will be able to recover. Um, uh, you need to be able to tell yourself positive things. Um, you know, you're doing well, you're doing great. You've been training for this all year. Uh, you're, you're a strong rider, keep it up, keep it going, keep turning those pedals. You can distract yourself, it's another strategy, using a mantra or using a poem or using a song or, 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 quite simp or just simply thinking of something else. Um, or another strategy is to focus your attention very, very sharply um, on your technique or on the rider in front of you uh, or whatever it may be. So all of that helps, your, helps take your mind off the, the pain in your legs and the, and, and, and the effort that you're, you're the, the idea is to reduce your perception of effort. So if it feels a little bit less hard, you're able to go harder. So that's it. A reminder that the two essentials, you know, those five tips I've just given you are important, but, but they're nothing compared to the two essential elements, which are um, pace, getting the pacing right and getting your fueling right. So those are the two things you really need to focus on the most. Um, and hopefully I've given you enough um, tips and, and enough information to help you do that. So that's it from me for the presentation. Uh, I, I just wish you uh, the best of luck for the last month or so of your training. Stay safe. Good luck. Come and see me in the. I will be in the in the village with a with a small stand uh, with uh, the, uh, the pink the pink tent, and uh, I'll be wearing my my pink jersey. I'm sure. Uh, come and see me. Be be a real pleasure. I can uh, we can talk through more of this if you would like to. And of course, if you're interested in joining one of our training camps at another time, be delighted to see you. And we also offer individual coaching. So all of that's available if you're interested. So thank you very much for your attention this evening.